Hi, Keith Livingston here with another edition of Healthy Intelligent Training. This morning I'm talking to Anne Ordain, who is one of the great New Zealand women competitors of the 80s. Anne trained in Otahu in South Auckland, initially with Gordon Perry. How did you first get started in the sport? Well, it's quite a story actually, Keith. Um, I was given up for adoption by a teenage mum and brought to Otahu by my adoptive parents. And uh, when I, I was a baby, and when I started to try and walk, my parents noticed that I wasn't using my feet correctly. And they let it go for a while, but I never started to walk as n normally. So the doctors looked at what I was doing and I was shuffling along on the backs of my, of my, on my heels. I would not go up on the front part of my feet. And they weren't really sure what was going on. So they told my parents they wanted to see me develop first, get a bit older so that they could actually see what was going on with my feet. Well, what was happened when I grew, the, the older I grew, the more these bone deformities at the front part of my feet developed and they just got really bad. And the only way I can describe them to your viewers is that they were severe, severe, severe bunions. They weren't bunions, but that's how they looked. And so the doctors told my parents that they didn't want to try and do surgery until I was a teenager. and My bones were strong enough to be able to handle and recover from the surgery. So through my younger years, um, I got around as best I could. I hated shoes. I couldn't wear shoes, to be honest. Um, thankfully, the Auckland climate allowed me to go barefoot quite a lot. I spent a lot of time on Waiheke Island with my grandmother, where I could be on the beaches and swim and, and go barefoot a great deal. Uh, I could walk to school barefoot because I could walk on people's grass lawns on my way to school. Um, but it was really difficult because there was an awful lot of pain. That's why I would not go forward, is because there was so much pain on the front part of my feet. So when I was 13 years old, the doctor said it was time to do surgery. And it was February of 1969, and I would, turn, I would start high school in Otahu uh, in February of um, 69. So they decided through the summer holidays uh, that that's when they would do the surgery, which made me really mad because all I wanted to do was be on Waiheke Island at the beach. So I, I go into Middlemore Hospital and I truly say these doctors were geniuses and if it was not for these doctors, you and I would not be talking right now. So they do the surgery and they tell my parents um, that they couldn't promise miracles, but they really hoped that what they would do would be allow me to get a better gait in terms of walking. They never said, it, never said anything about running. They just said, we hope that she can be out of pain and use the front part of her feet better. So when I, um, my famous photograph and the only photograph I have that I allowed my mom to take is my first day of high school, Another one is very famous and I cried the whole way through it and I didn't want the picture taken. But if I didn't have that picture, anything I just said, wouldn't everybody go, oh yeah, right, right, it didn't happen. So they did the surgery and I had plaster casts up to both knees. And when it came time to leave the hospital, they told my parents they weren't going to give me crutches or a wheelchair that they were gonna make me walk out of that hospital on those feet, which at this point had had broken bones, transplanted tendons, and I still had the stitches in my feet under those plaster casts. But they came up with an idea to teach me the heel-toe motion of walking, which I did not have. And they created a wooden rocker. So when you see the picture, I've got black leather boots. I swear I'm the first person to have those orthopedic boots that they give out to everybody now. But mine were specially made black leather boots that I laced up over the top of my casts. And on the bottom of that black leather boot was a wooden rocker, like a rocking horse. I walked out of that hospital on those feet. You talk about pain. I started high school. I went six weeks in those casts, walking around, looking absolutely ridiculous. But when those casts came off, my feet looked like everybody else's except for some major scars. And, um, it, you know, I went through rehab 
And you go back to talking about the Odahu Athletic Club. Well, that's what all the kids in Odahu did. They belonged to the Odahu Athletic Club. And so when mum and dad was like, okay, well, you know, what do you want to do? I said, I want to join the running club. I want to go to the Odahu Athletic Club. And mum and dad actually were very wary. They thought I was crazy. Um, and, but there were some neighbors that were encouraging aunts an aunt that was very encouraging um let her do it let her try and of course the beauty of new zealand back then the running tracks were grass so i still didn't have to wear any shoes <laughs> so I, I joined the Otago athletic club and um truly i joined in 1970 and that would have been the summer of 70 like january and february the summer season and I ran, I remember winning my first race. It was a cross country race at Home High College, running barefoot. And I won my first cross country race. And that's when my first coach, Jordan, Gordon Perry, saw me and asked to be able to coach me. So I was 14 years old. So one year after the surgery, I was a pretty good runner. What we haven't mentioned is that in the same street you were growing up in, there was a family of kids who you who are also um, keen on running. Yeah, Barbara Moore and her family lived up, oh, maybe just five houses away. And they, Barbara was a member of the Otahu Club and was also being trained by Gordon Purry, as were about another 30 kids or older people. I mean, as you know, the club system in New Zealand um, is for everybody from five years of age to 95 if you want to still run. So um, she was part of the club as well. And in the end, we got to be really good friends and we would walk up to the club together to go training and we'd walk home. Um, I mean, we were in Auckland teams together. We were just buddies. We were really good buddies. What we remember you most for in New Zealand is your marvelous gun to tape run in the 3000 meters to beat Wendy Sly, um, who was later an Olympic silver medalist. Um, in 84 I think and yes. um, can you tell us about after having um, switched to John Davies what was the big biggest change in your training or mindset or a little bit about Gordon I was with him for 10 years and he was a very hard taskmaster and um, my comment would be is he never had a plan you would turn up to train and you didn't know what you were going to be doing that day. So that would be the biggest change that Gordon never had a plan and John had a plan because there was the Lydia plan. Um, the other thing though, that, that there were two things I learned from Gordon was first of all, well, both coaches, to be honest, Gordon at least really believed in hill workouts and hill reps and hill training which to be, to be honest with my feet was the most productive workout I could do because the more I could make my feet strong, the better I ran. So thankfully, Gordon really believed in hill repeats and hill training really good. But I never ran over an hour with Gordon ever in 10 years. So the biggest switch was, now the positive switch was the fact that John had a plan. But the second thing he had to teach me or tell me to do was I was now going to have to run longer runs. And so <laughs> I remember my first, uh, he just said to me, Annie, he said, when I asked him to coach me, uh, which was the end of 1980, after the 1980 boycott of the Olympic Games and a lot of other issues where I truly had quit the sport. And somebody recommended to me that I ask John Davies to coach me. And then after he said yes, he said, well, I need to tell you, I'm going to turn your training program upside down and inside out because I've watched you through the years. I know how you've been coached. You ran pretty well. But if you listen to me and you do what I tell you to do, you'll get to the top of the world. And so he took me up to um, Woodhill Forest, north of Auckland. We drove up there and we parked at a locked gate. And he said, we're going to run 15 miles and you're not going to stop. <laughs> and, 
and you're going to have to get back to this gate because I can't get the car in the Woodhill Forest to come and get you. And so I ran with him and he was in really good shape. I mean, he could yeah. run. And so there was an uphill finish to the car and I'm just dead. I've never run that far in my life. And we're going up this hill and he says, you are not going to stop. And he's got his hand <laughs> in the middle of my back, pushing me up the hill. And so that was the start where he sat me down and this is what you're going to do. Now he started me off with 15 miles, um, but this is the summer of 81. And then there was a New Zealand cross country team getting ready to go to the World Cross Country Championships in Madrid, Spain in March of 81. I was terribly out of shape. I mean, I was overweight. I had really let myself go. And he said, Annie, you've got to make that team. I'm like, John, I can't do that. I'm in terrible shape. Of course you can. I mean, that was the whole thing. Of course you can. And so he trained me and I was a mess. I was terrible. I knew I was a terrible pupil for him to have. But he kept telling me I could do it. And I made that cross country team by one second. I made the sixth position by one second. And I remember a whole bunch of gals sitting in that room saying, how on earth are they going to choose, choose her? <laughs> I, was, I looked a mess, but I made so much quick progress under him. I really did. And so I went to Madrid, Spain and, and raced in the world cross country and was honestly going to be coming back to New Zealand. Um, but while in Madrid, Spain, Rod Dixon was on the New Zealand team and uh, Dick Quax was already in the United States. And both of them said, to, because we'd been in so many teams together when I was young, um, it's not that they're much older than me, but uh, I had run, I'd traveled with them in Europe and I'd run on the um, European track circuit with John and Dick and, and Rod, John Walker and Dick Quax and Rod Dixon. And so they knew me. They knew how I could run. I'd go out on training runs with them. And both of them said, you've got to go to the States. You've got to go to the States. That's your niche, road racing. Not the marathon, the road racing. That's your niche. You've got to go. Instead of coming back to New Zealand, I came to the United States, and here I am. Tell us more about your sojourn in the States, because I think from what I've read, that you were the winningest road racer in US women's road race history. I came here after the World Cross Country, which was April of 81. In fact, I came a week before President Reagan was shot. So that was my introduction to the United States. Um, and Dick Quacks got me into a road race in New Orleans. So my first introduction to, a, uh, to an American city was New Orleans. So that was a real eye opener for a young girl from Otahoo. And I ran in the 10K and, and Dick had told the race director that I'd run 34 minutes for a 10K, which back in 1981 was a really good time, but I'd never run 10K before. So he told a little lie to get me into this race. So I turn up in New Orleans and the race directors picked me up at the airport and put me in a fancy hotel room and, get me to come down to the press conference and they're all excited to have me. And I sit in the back row of the press conference and they go, oh no, you've got to go up. You're on the front, you're on the podium. You've got to go up there with these others. The others were Frank Shorter, Bill Rogers, Joan Benoit Samuelson, they, I mean, and I'm up there and I'm thinking, oh my Lord, what did Dick tell them? <laughs> what did he tell them? <laughs> And so I, I, got my, I got myself down on the end. So I knew I'd be the last one asked any question. And uh, so it comes down to me and the, the um, moderator says, well, you've come all the way from New Zealand and you've got a really fast 10K time. How do you think you're going to do tomorrow? And I was smart enough. They didn't, they didn't tell me how fast. <laughs> my time was that I had not run um, but I was smart enough to say at that point well I think I'll run my best time tomorrow 
which would have been the truth, which was going to be the truth because it would be the first time I've ever run a 10K. Well, I actually ran 33 minutes and 13 seconds for third place. Um, so I looked like I looked like I'd beat my best time by a minute. So then everybody, and that was a good time in 1981. Mm. And so everybody at that point thought, oh my goodness, this New Zealand girl can run. And so I got a lot of support um, from folks here. I got offered homes, oh, basements, you know, beds in their basements. Um, Dick Quacks got me some shoes from Nike because he was working for Nike then. He got me a place to stay. Other people helped me out. Um, some uh, guys that were race directors had running stores like in Denver, Colorado, and they'd pay me a little bit of under the table money to do some speaking in the store. So it came to uh, June of 1981, and I'd been told the rumors that Nike was going to put up prize money for a road race where they were headquartered in Beaverton, Oregon, and they were going to push for the sport to turn professional. And it was going to be $50,000 equally divided between the male and female athletes, $10,000 first prize. And they were encouraging everybody that was running on the circuit to turn up in Oregon and run in this race. Uh, so I went there because I had watched all the under the table money in Europe for the guys. Women didn't get much because we only had 800 and 1500 meters. So there weren't even any opportunities really to run in Europe. But I just thought if I ever get the chance to earn money out of running, I'm going for it. So I turned up in Oregon and uh, the night before we were all in a room and we were all told that we had to sign a document to say whether we would accept the money the next day and did we understand the consequences of accepting that money well there were two different sets of consequences which they didn't point out the american athletes if they accepted the money were not going to get a ban they were only get going to get suspended with the rights to appeal because of the american constitution what they didn't know and what I didn't know, even though I was all for doing it, was that other countries didn't have the same system and that I would get a ban for taking the money, an international ban. I didn't know that. I was listening to them say, you'll just get suspended and then we'll, we will fight for you. So the next day I lined up and it's a 15 kilometers and it's in Portland, Oregon. It's five miles up a windy hill and four miles down. And I was a very strong uphill runner. Um, so anyway, great field, you know, and, and great field. And I thought I'm going up and I'm thinking, well, if I finish fifth or sixth, I'll earn enough money to stay in the United States a bit longer because I was running out of money. Uh, but I ran up that hill as hard as I could and no one came with me. So then I ran all the way Back down hoping no one else would catch me up and I ended up winning and won ten thousand dollars which was a lot of a lot of money <laughs> in 1981 in fact if it, right now you would say well it was twenty thousand dollars now if not more so I mean that's very exciting and it was three times what I was earning as a teacher in New Zealand but I was in a lot of trouble because the New Zealand Athletic Federation which was then the New Zealand Amateur Athletic Federation, um, immediately sent me a telegram to say that I was banned internationally. I was also in trouble with United States immigration because I was only here on a visitor's visa and it's illegal to win that money on a visitor's visa. And obviously the IRS, IRS was right there to figure out what we were all going to do uh, money wise and pay our taxes and so forth. But the positive side was that the American road race directors ignored my ban because they wanted the change. They wanted to get out of the um, appearance money, all that kind of world. They wanted it all above board. And so they supported me. They ignored my ban. And so I continued to race through the rest of 1981 earning more money. But then in, I think October or November of 81, United States immigration 
pretty much deported me, told me to go back to New Zealand, go to the American Embassy, figure out what visa I needed to be able to come back to the United States to earn money through running. And so that's what I did. Um, but I arrive in New Zealand and the New Zealand AAA says, you're not running here. We don't want you at a track meet. We don't want you. Your bands, we don't want you. They didn't even want me to attend a track meet as a spectator. So at that point, John says to me, well, Annie, you've got to have a reason to be doing all this training. It'll all get worked out. You'll get your visa. You'll go back to the States. You've got to have a reason to be doing all this training. I think, <laughs> I think you should attempt the world record in the 5,000 meters on the track. I go, John, I've never run 5,000 meters on the track. I hadn't even run 3,000 meters at that point. So he goes, yeah, I think you can break the world record in the 5,000 meters. He said, you've got to have something to train for. You've got to have a goal. And this is really where I think we were a great team because I trusted his training program so much. He'd obviously proven it to me. I mean, I made such quick progress under him. It was just off the charts. I mean, it just was. And so here I am, you know, in the States winning all these road races, running really good times in not even a year after joining him. So he'd proven that part to me. The funny part was, was really? You think I can break a world record? He was so convincing. And uh, so anyway, um, and the other thing that was crazy was Greta Weitz from Norway, famous, right? Nine time winner of the you know, New York Marathon. She'd come down to run in New Zealand through the track series that we used to have in the summertime. I watched her attempt the world 5,000 meter record in Christchurch and she didn't get it. And I remember sitting in the stands with John saying, that's Greta White. And you think I can run faster than her? <laughs> it was Paula Fudge from England had it. Yeah, yeah. And it was 15 minutes and 14 seconds. Yeah, yeah. And Greta ran 15 minutes and 20 seconds. Mm. And I look at, and John goes, yeah, you can do it. So anyway, in March of um, 82, um, we set up a special attempt at Mount Smart Stadium because I was still banned. So I wasn't allowed to attend any track meet. I wasn't allowed to do it at an official track meet. But John arranged for me to do it with as long as you had three official timers. There was about 100 people turned up. It was filmed on TVNZ. Um, you had to have four women in the event to make it legitimate. So there was Lorraine Moller, Barbara Moore, and... Oh, Debbie, Debbie Ellsworth. Ellsworth, yes. So there were four of us. So that made it legal. And uh, so anyway, I ended up breaking the world record just by one second. In the first time that I'd ever, ever raced 5,000 meters on the track. Then they said I couldn't have it because I was a banned athlete. I got handed it at the Commonwealth Games when I got reinstated a week before the Commonwealth Games in October of 82. Commonwealth Games, um, what are your main memories of that final? I went on a year where I was unbeaten in every road race in the United States and I set a course record in every road race I ran in 1982. That's how come I'm getting that title of the winningness because in the end, I had 75 victories out of 112 starts. And I was 90% in the top three. So that's John Davies training program right there. Mm -hmm. Consistency. So I came up here and I'm on a, a rampage. And John calls me up and says, I want you to go to the Commonwealth Games. And I go, John, I'm still a band athlete. I don't want to go. He goes, yes, I think the band's going to be lifted. I think you should make the New Zealand team. I think you should go. And I said, no kept on saying no. I was like, no, I'm up here. I'm winning. I want to stay on the roads. I don't want to do it. And he kept on with me, like, do it for your country. Do it for me. Do it for your family. You could become New Zealand's first track gold medalist. And he, <laughs> he just kept going on at me. And so I said, okay, if you can prove to me that I can do road race training and track training and combine the two, 
and still honor my road races that I've said I'm going to run, if you can prove that to me, I'll do it. So I flew to Brisbane three weeks before the race and I was still a band athlete. So you imagine that kind of pressure where I've traveled all that way, I've given up racing in the States, I'm supposed to be trying to win a gold medal, according to Don, and I'm still banned. The ban has not been lifted. And it was lifted one week before I lined up in that race. So that was pretty stressful. And he just kept saying to me, um, you can do it, you're in great shape. Um, but the, the, the funniest story is that he was commentating for New Zealand television and he came out onto the warm up track and he said to me, well, Annie, it's really windy. And I always wanted to be a front runner. I was always a front runner. I was a front runner here in the States, front runner on the track, as long as you know <laughs> anybody let me, I was always out in front. So um, he says, I don't want you to lead the race. It's really windy. You've got a good kick. Just don't lead the race. Promise me you won't lead the race. And I think at that point, um, I was only ranked ninth in the field. So he's probably right. Um, but I was in really good shape and obviously had a great deal of confidence from everything I'd been doing in the States. And, and I knew I was running really fast. And my workouts were just, I never would have dreamed that I could be doing what I was doing. And once again, this is now only 15 months after joining John. Uh, so I had a terrible amount of confidence in his training. Uh, and then mentally, I think, I just pretty tough. I just want to win. Very competitive, but more so competitive with myself. Um, that's why I liked to be a front runner, because I could dictate. The other reason that I wanted to be a front runner is because my feet didn't handle the stop start of a crowded field. I needed to run smooth. So I was much smoother out in front and I was much more comfortable out in front. So we line up on the you know 3000 meter curve and uh, there are 24 women in the race and you get to draw a card for your starting position on that line. And I drew number one, the pole position, which is a dangerous position to be in because everybody's gonna take off fast and come in off that curve and you can get pushed off the side of the track. And if you step over, you're the one disqualified. So I took off very fast and ended up out in front. And I'm coming around because John's gonna be commentating above the 100 meter, the, no, the start finish line. And, uh, and I'm thinking, oh no, I'm out in front. He's gonna be going crazy and I, paused a bit to see if someone would go past me and they didn't. So I go on a bit further, pause again, no one goes past me. And to be honest, at that point, my mental side is, I'm just going for it. If I get beaten, I get beaten. Um, so I just did it. Took 15 seconds off my best time and won a gold medal. Set a Commonwealth record, uh, New Zealand. I mean, I just did it. And poor old John was having heart failure up commentating for television New Zealand. But you know, to this day, I'm still New Zealand's only female track gold medalist. You went to the Montreal Olympics. And also Commonwealth Games in 74. Yep, I was sixth in the 1500 meters in, in Christchurch and I was 18 years old. I went to Montreal and didn't even get past the first round, running my best times. I was in, New Zealand cross country teams five times, finishing ninth in the world cross country three times. I mean, there's 74, 78 Commonwealth, um, 82, 1990. Um, and then I qualified for Munich in 72. I was 16 years old, went to Montreal at 20, qualified for Moscow at 24, but there was the boycott, went to Los Angeles in 84 and Seoul in 88 and qualified for Barcelona in 92, but decided to retire instead. If there is a single uh, moment, moment you savor. It would, it would be the gold medal in Brisbane because it was 13 years after I'd had my feet surgery and there'd been an awful lot of ups and downs. I quit the sport in 1980. 
And so this is now only two years after absolutely quitting the sport and pretty much just completely starting over. And I think, you know, I look at it and, I mean, that night after winning that gold medal, um, John Davies and I and Keith Quinn went out to a Chinese restaurant. John is um, sitting at the table with my medal around his neck. And it's just, I mean, I just remember that. He was so proud. He was just so proud. And, and that he sat there and he's just sitting in the, in the Chinese restaurant with my medal around his neck. So, no, that was, that was really special. And, you know, I could have retired after that year. I was unbeaten in the United States. I had a world record and a gold medal. But I went on for another 10 years after that. Retired when I was 36 years old. John Davies um, coached the male and female world 5,000 meter record holders at the same time. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's where people don't even know that. There's no one else that's done that. Yeah. I don't think. Dick Quacks had the, the men's record, 13-12.9, and he mm -hmm. narrowly missed it the year before. I was there when he narrowly missed it. And that's what went through my mind on the last lap of my attempt was don't damn well miss it by a second. Mm. So I, I got it by a second. But mm. that went through my mind because I remember John being so mad at him because he threw his hands up too soon and he missed the world record by a second. And of course, then he got it. But I, I, that went through my mind is when John yelled at me in the last lap at Mount Smart, he goes, Annie, you're down five seconds. You're down five seconds. You're down five seconds. Okay, John. I got it. <laughs> so I pulled it out and got it by a second. Oh, that's tremendous. Well, thanks for that, um, Anne. Oh, you're uh, so welcome. <laughs>